Okay, we've got one minute to go. So I would just like to say thank you to the attendees that have joined the call. Um, we'll populate the lobby as we go. Um, we'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, we only have an hour, so we want to make it as informative as possible. So I'll give over to Bill. And um, Bill, you can do a small introduction of yourself and introduce uh, SPED to the attendees that are online. Uh, <clears throat> uh, can you hear me okay? 100%. So uh, <clears throat> I'm Bill Beasley, and I'm executive director of the Society of Piping Engineers and Designers. And I'd like to thank Kempute for hosting the second of two seminars that we're offering to uh, engineers and pipers in South Africa. And today's topic is uh, to discuss a uh, report actually on a seminar we did on uh, full scope piping management with high value engineering centers. And I'm First, going to introduce why SPED cares about uh, high value ed engineering centers, what the seminar find, and then I want to talk what our findings were, and then talk a little bit about the impact on our professional piping designer level four certification program uh, will be. So, and what we what we might do next. So, why does SPED? The Society of Piping Engineers and Designers care about high value engineering centers. Well, we certify piping skills and our highest level skill, as we'll discuss in a minute, has to do with piping leads. So we want to know what piping leads in today's environment have to know to manage uh, piping work where HVACs are involved. I'm sorry, is somebody asking a question? Um, so there's four levels, SPED is a certification program for professional piping designers. Uh, it's four levels. It's a uh, level one is basic. That means you're properly trained for routing pipe from nozzle to nozzle. There's an advanced level, which means you can organize and quality assure work. Uh, senior level where you can do equipment layout uh, to be easily piped. You know, it's elevate, positioning, elevation, separation, orientation and so on. And then a piping lead where you uh, expect to be able to manage, estimate and assure full scope piping work. We qualify these people through testing and acceptable levels of experience. All our criteria for these levels is managed by a PPD advisory committee, which are made up only of certified PP level four members. Uh, it oversees PPD certification, and it's the owner of Recommended Practice 01, Recommended Practice for Assessing Piping Designer Baseline Skills and Competencies. And uh, it is the recommender of changes to PPD certification program. It recommends it to the board, of course. And uh, currently, we do have a published level of levels of competence. I won't go into them in detail, but it starts out as a learner and ends up with a licensed professional. So what is uh, PPD level four in particular? It's the highest skill level in the PPD certification program, and it's intended to document full scope piping lead experience and knowledge. Uh, it requires a passing grade on uh, PPD level four and one, one grade below, which is level three exams, and 20 years experience acceptable to the board. Uh, we use recommendations from people who have observed that work to validate the experience. Now, <clears throat> we've test in several areas. Uh, first of all, we assume that the PPD level one, two, and three skills are already present. So the remaining areas we look at are planning and bidding, executing lead tasks, and management and metrics. And in the planning and bidding area, there are things like plant design tasks, uh, uh, costing, staff planning, scheduling, statement of work content, and IT support. That's scheduling uh, computer support for a project. 
In the execution area, we look at staff assignment, that's assigning, uh, you know, staffing a project, field work, completion and commissioning and closeout. Uh, and in the management area, we look at fulfillment of contracts, percent completion estimates, change in scope management, and RFQ documentations that you might see in work packages. I don't have time to go into all these requirements because I want to hit the impact of a high value engineering center on all these uh, assumed and, and certified skills. Uh, to assess the impact of high value engineering centers, SPED sponsored a seminar in November of 2021. Uh, uh, and uh, it was co-hosted by myself as executive director and head of the Houston chapter, uh, also by Bruce Fraser, who's a SPED director and Calgary chapter president, and Ron Walden, who is the PBDAC chairman uh, representing the Midwest chapter, and he's actually a president emeritus of the society. We had several SPED officers in attendance and a lot of participants. And the uh, link to this uh, seminar is available, or should be available soon online. The uh, distinguishing characteristic about uh, high value engineering centers is it's a disciplined resource designed to supply a majority of engineering hours physically remotely from the legally responsible engineer in charge for the project or project discipline. And the idea is to do it at a reduced cost to the clients, and that means. Typically, this HVA say, is located offshore. So the business case is uh, you add value through specialized expertise at a lower total project cost. Though all overall hours may increase, the blended rate is such that the upfront savings on engineering costs, there's an upfront savings on, on the engineering costs for the project. Now, the thing to understand here about HVACs, and I've made this point and everyone else makes this point, is engineers and designers rarely work at the job site. Some do, but most of the really intense plant design is done off-site and sometimes and almost always away from the client's office. Uh, so almost no one works at the job site. That's the last mile, the end mile of the work. Traditional work, the EPC team is located close to the job site and the client, uh, typically with a client represented embedded in the engineering office. And local offices and other nearby locations offer surge capacity with oversight from the main project office. However, in HVEC work, centric work, a portion of the EPC is located remotely from the client and the home office. Uh, typically, a majority of the hours are are, uh, are moved to this remote office, and it works under the supervision of the project office, which is closer to the client. That means uh, you have to oversight by statement of works, visits, deputies, telecoms, Zoom calls. It's quite difficult, but it does it can be made to work, as we'll see. So does it work? Yes, uh, but it means piping leads have to do a lot more work. And that was our findings of the seminar. Despite the complaints of a lot of angry piping designers in, in uh, client cities, client-centric cities, uh, you can make a high value engineering centers work, but there are a lot of challenges. First of all, vetting is critical. I'll we'll talk about these in more detail. It's 24 seven management, it's difficult. You have to have a liaison, serve as a voice of the customer. You got to set the right expectations with management. There are cultural languages different, and uh, the site and the client remote remoteness is always going to be an issue, and there's a lot of head office strain. So let's look at these in more detail. First of all, vetting is incredibly difficult. Resum resumes are not definitive, and sometimes these remote offices, their declared capabilities are how should I put it, aspirational? Uh, <clears throat> so the issue is how do you qualify these offices and qualify personnel? You have to look at their work history. You, it, and I'll talk about it a little bit. Some knowledgeable liaison has to interview them uh, and get a sense of their uh, knowledge of the, uh, the equipment we're dealing with. 
And sometimes they try to bring some people from the HVAC center to work on the feed if that insurance company is fortunate enough to have the feed work. It does put a greater burden of proof on the HVACs to prove their capabilities. And uh, it does also uh, offer a chance to get third party credentialing, such as the SPED PBD certification program, but there are other credentials as well. Another finding is that management is more difficult. There has to be a correct division of responsibility in the project statement of work. Uh, then also, uh, there has to be a sense of uh, scheduling and progress reality. You have to have a way to validate local progress. With this uh, greater division of responsibility, you have to budget increased hours for li liaison work, uh, uh, personnel. And there's a greater dependence on explicit work packages at a more granular level. Another finding is this uh, important role played by a liaison. Uh, the issues are you, you have, uh, someone has to supervise and check and mentor distant staff. And almost all checking is gonna be done through the review of electronic documents. So the liaison serves as a proxy for managers and engineer who are in turn answering to the client and other stakeholders. Uh, that could include, for example, uh, regulatory jurisdictions. So uh, uh, the liaison also does local interpretation of work instructions. Somebody tells you how to do something, the liaison makes sure those instructions are clear to the, the actual person performing the work. But another important role he plays is a gatekeeper to avoid overloading project management. The too much checking goes to the main office. These overburdened managers uh, just uh, can't deal with the strain. So, uh, and finally, the liaison serves as the, the voice of the responsible engineers and managers on quality. Make sure that nothing of low quality gets forwarded on to busy managers and engineers. Another issue is this setting the right expectations with clients. Uh, this, you know, most people have told me this, there's a fallacy out there that there's one team. A 24 seven work means that remote teams are almost side by side. That's not true. Uh, there could be a lot of coordination, but it's done through an intense amount of very explicit work instruction and a lot of intensive checking. And remember, of course, liability does not assure responsibility. So uh, how do you answer those expectations? You have to budget high, clients have to understand you have to have higher liaison hours and increased uh, work on planning and checking. And that responsibility of uh, falls to the responsible engineers and managers. Another issue is culture languages differences. Uh, there are some cultural differences in whether people self-check and are responsible. There are language problems, understanding explicit instructions. Uh, that's where the, uh, you, the mentoring and gatekeeping by the liaison officers, the liaison staff will, uh, will continue to push responsibility for checking down to the designers and engineers in the HVAC to make sure their work meets the required standard. And those explicit instructors have to be enforced by liaison. Another issue is uh, the remoteness, the, just the complete remoteness from the, the site and the client. Uh, these remote offices often have never experienced the site, but uh, before that goes too far, remember that very few people today are allowed to visit the site anyway. So almost all of us are dealing with information that from scanning or other information brought from the site and from the client. Uh, but there's uh, often unfamiliar with the, uh, unfamiliarity with the equipment itself. People are assigned to the project, they've never worked on a particular kind of equipment, and that's not detected until a lot of their work is done. And they're out of touch with the client. They're not in direct client contact. So the liaison has to serve as the voice of the customer in these remote offices. And he has to vet the staff on the particular equipment and the site practices that we're uh, contending with. There's a tremendous strain on the head office 
Uh, there's extended hours for meetings and it, informal work assignments, like running over and telling somebody to do something is almost impossible. So that means management hours have to span shared staff hours in HVACs. You have to have some overlap there. And there's a, a huge demand on making your work instructions explicit and clear. It's like writing a statement work for every task. So what does this mean to our level four requirements, which is why SPED is involved in this issue? Uh, it's clear to us we're going to have to differentiate uh, high value engineering centers and co-located project uh, division of responsibilities. We're going to have to make that division clear to our uh, lead people and test for that. Also, we're going to have to include more requirements for vetting, more attention to vetting of staff. How is that done? Uh, we're going to have to define this liaison role more clearly, uh, perhaps more clearly than I've done it today, and have a greater impact uh, emphasis on work packaging uh, I should say work packing instead of work packing it should be work packaging at very low levels of granularity. It's very difficult to do. It can be taught, but it's very difficult to do. And then we're going to deal with a lot of schedules with overlapping work days. So here are the takeaways from today's seminar, I hope for you. When the sun never sets on a project, the sun never sets on its management. So uh, for every responsible engineer, every task becomes a contract, and it has to be that explicit. The liaison uh, at site at the HVAC is, a, is the voice of the customer, but also the gatekeeper of results. Uh, so you get cheaper HVAC uh, worker hours, much cheaper, but you're going to have to add in liaison hours. And management workdays have to overlap. And finally, staff vetting is incredibly difficult. If you want to know more about SPED, I, uh, you can contact Catherine Vanderwald, uh, who actually is located in uh, Johannesburg. Uh, so it's quite convenient to get hold of her. And I've got some information in the notes. <clears throat> so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, so we can add um, questions to the chat or we can just ask Bill directly if there are any questions. You are more than welcome to ask now. <laughs> Uh, hi, Bill. This is uh, uh, Werner here from Compute. I have a, a quick question for you. It, it's how does a, you know, a remote HVAC office prove that they are able or fit to be able to conduct the, uh, the work requested? Um, well, uh, that's the most difficult question I could get. And thank you for asking it. Uh, I think if you're a remote uh, office wanting to serve as a high value engineering center, you have to extensively qualify your staff uh, in, in particular with particular emphasis on, on third party skills, uh, a lot of training, a lot of credible training on the, on the software, uh, a lot of uh, explicit uh, proven work experience on uh, resumes where most ex uh, most experience is stated and then make sure that if you declare yourself uh, capable of doing a particular task that you have the local management and liaison uh, personnel to follow through on that promise because you might uh, you know as much to your surprise somebody might actually assign you that work and you have to behave as if you're just a local workforce it ought to be almost transparent, except for a little scheduling uh, difficulties should almost be transparent. So proving that uh, as uh, vetting staff, credentialing staff, uh, having work experience on the equipment would be good. And if you don't have the experience, you can show it in the staff you've hired, but also your ability to manage uh, 
uh, assign st uh, assignments that are sent to you with very explicit statements of work at a very low level. Okay, Bill, I see there's a question in the chat box from Paul. Um, can you access the chat box? I, let's see if I, how I do that. I don't quite know how to get to the chat box. Could you read the question for me? Okay, it's too bad. There is mostly only um, a credential info about failures due to the HVEC. Um, because PR wise, every project is a successful project. But anyway, at the rate you can pay for HVEC, you can have the plant designed two or three times. Yeah, well, uh, that's a fallacy. Uh, you know, we, we, the fallacy is you can do it wrong and you always have time to do it over right. But the, What's missing here is that the wrongness of, of your work has to be detected by the checker. So you're really burdening the checker and burdening uh, project management when you do that. And it leaves a bitter taste in that mouth because inspectors and checkers can only find so many errors. So uh, most projects today, at least in the US, that want to use high value, edit, high value engineering centers don't want to run a school for people that can't do the work. They prefer to have people that have good experience and good mentoring and have very close skills to what they're doing. It doesn't have to be exactly right on, but they have to be uh, capable enough to where it's just a question of mentoring and uh, coordination to get them turning out the right level of work. But nobody wants to run a school, even if it's two and three times cheaper. Nobody wants to run a school for anybody. And you don't have that. Usually we don't have time like that in the project. How do, I, how do I see the chat? Okay. I'm going to get a little help here seeing chat. Okay, all right. And it doesn't look like yours has the chat here. That's interesting. Oh, wait. Maybe. Okay. So I don't see how to get to the chat. So I'm going to have to rely on Leanne to tell me what the what the chat questions are because I don't uh, not familiar enough with this software. So have I answered that question sufficiently? Any other questions? Um, I think um, that is it, Paul. Um, we've not received okay. a uh, additional question in the chat. So I do thank you. This was a great informative um, session. So if there are any additional questions, you can route it to um, us here at Compute um, or directly to Catherine, and then we can um, just distribute it to, to Bill. Um, I see we've got uh, Rhino typing, so I'm not sure if that is a question. We'll just hang on a little bit more before ending the call. Okay. Well, uh, if there aren't any more questions, and if that's the end, then I'd like to thank Compute for hosting this series. They've hosted two seminars, which we were glad to give. And uh, these are important issues, and uh, we look forward to working with uh, Compute and other, other groups in South Africa. And I appreciate the, uh, your attention today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Bill. And thank you for everyone for joining. We'll share the information once the call drops. Um, yes, so we will be sending out the slides. Yes, yes, we will. Okay, thank you everyone. Have a, a good day. Bye-bye.